Greetings, and welcome back, gentles and ladies, to another installment of the Dreamcast Era Sonic Marathon. I'm Exa Paradigm Gamer, and it's time to talk about Sonic Heroes for the GameCube, Xbox, and PlayStation 2. While this game certainly has its fans, some people will argue that it was this game, and not the likes of Shadow or 06, that really kicked off the ominous Dark Age of Sonic. And that's kind of surprising, because out of all the games in the trilogy, this one feels the most like a classic Sonic title. You'd think it'd be the fan favorite of the bunch, but that's strangely not the case. Why is that? Well, let's find out. As some of you may know, Sonic Heroes was actually my first Sonic game. My brother and I rented it from our local Hollywood video back in 2004, and we were hooked. I remember rushing through Seaside Hill, Grand Metropolis, and Casino Park. I remember my first meeting with Dr. Eggman, not Robotnik, and his Egg Hawk mech. While I was never able to finish the game at the time, Sonic Heroes still has a special place in my heart for introducing me to the series and making me want to rent and try the adventure games, and eventually crash and burn with the Sonic Mega Collection. That was my first exposure to the classics, and back then, I really didn't like them all that much. As someone who wasn't familiar with retro game design at the time, the lack of unlimited continues frustrated me and made me not want to finish them. I'm sure I'm sure that 9 year old me would have had a better experience if I would known about the Mega Collection save state feature, but at the end of the day, the classic gameplay just wasn't gelling with me. I was used to playing a Sonic in 3D, so the 2D gameplay just felt off at the time. Since then, I've beaten all of the games and have a much better appreciation for what makes them so great for so many people, but it was still something of a rough transition. So many people had a similar experience going from 2D Sonic to 3D Sonic, so hopefully this anecdote helped to illustrate that it's perhaps more about what you were exposed to first that it is about whether certain playstyles are inherently good or immutably bad. Anyways, a lot of people have asked me why it is I refer to Sonic Heroes as part of the Dreamcast era when it was never released on the Sega Dreamcast. The period I refer to as the Dreamcast era comprises the games between the end of the classic era and the start of the Dark Age. I'd also argue that Sonic Heroes retains enough similarities with the adventure games in terms of the control scheme, story presentation, and art direction, enough to consider it a quasi-sequel. Really, I could call this time period anything, even the Green Eyes era. I've elected to use the Dreamcast era moniker because that's what it was referred to in Sonic Generations, so it's the closest thing to an official name that we have. Anyways, Sonic Heroes entered development shortly after the release of Sonic Adventure 2 in 2001. The game's director and future series producer Takashi Izuka elected to abandon the Sonic Adventure formula to make the game more accessible to casual players, believing a Sonic Adventure 3 would only appeal to core Sonic fans. Sonic Heroes was the first main series Sonic title to be released after Sega dropped out of the home console market. Thus, the game saw a multi-platform release on the Sony PlayStation 2, Microsoft Xbox, and Nintendo GameCube. While that's par for the course nowadays, back then, playing a Sonic game on a Nintendo console was considered a huge deal. The PS2 version is considered the worst of the bunch, as it features a stuttering frame rate, mild technical issues, and it also swaps the circle and cross buttons outside of Japan. The Nintendo GameCube version is technically more solid and features 480p progressive scan. The Xbox version is pretty much the same deal. Surprisingly, unlike the adventure games, Sonic Heroes has not seen a worldwide digital re-release on current gen systems. There was a PSN version that's apparently pretty solid, but it was only released for European gamers. There was also a PC version that can be modded to output in 1080p widescreen. For this review, I'm looking at the GameCube version, because that's the version I happen to own. Even though I didn't necessarily like everything about them, I still consider Sonic Adventure to be a decent game, while Sonic Adventure 2 remains one of my personal top 10 Sonic games. Both titles have definitely aged in many aspects, but so has practically every other other high-profile video game of the time. While I'll still come back to both adventure titles on a semi-regular basis for one reason or another, I haven't touched Sonic Heroes in quite some time. While it was never one of my favorite Sonic games to begin with, the recent surge of negativity has renewed my curiosity about the game's overall quality. Does Sonic Heroes still provide a fun gameplay experience today, or are contemporary reviewers right to call this game the start of the Dark Age? Without further ado, this is Sonic Heroes for 6th Gen Systems. The plot of Sonic Heroes is one of the most layered and intricate in the whole series. Not since Dr. Mario Miracle Cure was I so engrossed in determining character motivations and identifying themes and motifs. Truly, even The Last of Us has nothing on Sonic Heroes' narrative. In all seriousness, Sonic Heroes plot-wise is likely among the goofiest and most bare-bones in the 3D series. And that's not a bad thing. Unlike Sonic Adventure, and Adventure 2 to a lesser extent, Sonic Heroes isn't bogged down with a bunch of repeat cutscenes that add very little to the overall plot. If you're like me and enjoy Sonic games 
the most with a balanced cutscene to gameplay ratio, I think you'll appreciate what Heroes does. In essence, the plot revolves around four teams of three characters going after Dr. Ivo Eggman Robotnik for one reason or another. Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles receive a letter from the Doctor revealing his renewed intent to conquer the world in three days, and so the triumphant trio rush off to stop him, apparently forgetting that they have a fucking plane. Amy, Cream, and Big begin a manhunt for Sonic when a newspaper clipping appears to implicate the Blue Hedgehog in the kidnapping of Cream's friend Chocola Chow and Big's missing friend Froggy. The Chaotix return from the 32X classic Knuckles Chaotix, this time running a detective agency. One day, Charmy, Espio, and Vector receive a gig from an anonymous client, who charges them with running odds and ends against Dr. Eggman. Meanwhile, Rouge breaks into one of Eggman's bases looking for the Doctor's treasure and uncovers an apparently living Shadow the Hedgehog in a stasis tube. Rouge and Shadow are attacked by E-123 Omega, who eventually reveals that he's cheesed off at Eggman for locking him up in a base to guard Shadow. Shadow is suffering from amnesia, and because Rouge won't just tell him who he is for some goddamn reason, he decides that Eggman of all people will most likely have the answers he's looking for. The three form an unlikely alliance and attempt to track down the Doctor. Again, it's all pretty basic compared to the adventure games, and comes very close to a storyline you'd see in a classic series game. Dr. Eggman's being a dick, so Sonic and friends set off to stop him. Things get a little more complicated towards the end, but not by too terribly much. At the end of the day, it's simple, straightforward, and lighthearted. And for a Sonic game, that's all you really need. In terms of story presentation, Sonic Heroes is easily the best game in the Dreamcast era. The voice acting and writing aren't going to win any awards, but for what it's worth, it gets the job done and seems to have improved somewhat from the last two games. Most lines are delivered competently, the sound mixing is more balanced, and there aren't any noticeably awkward pauses or cuts. What's also nice is that Sonic Team finally bothered to lip sync the English dialogue, and it looks pretty good. The animations seem improved as well, with cutscenes feeling more dynamic and better paced than Adventure 1, while mixing the awkward mocap from Adventure 2. My only real criticism is that the character models, while they look pretty good during actual gameplay, don't look amazing when viewed up close during cutscenes. Other than that, the presentation feels pretty solid and never really gets in the way of the experience. In terms of the story and its presentation, Sonic Heroes is pretty solid. So what about the aesthetics? Overall, it's very well done. The GameCube, PlayStation 2, and Xbox were more powerful than the Dreamcast, and Sonic Team took advantage of that. While Sonic Adventure 2 was a great looking game, it was a little starred for color on occasion, seeing as many stages took place indoors or at night. Sonic Heroes doesn't have this problem, featuring bright, colorful, and cartoony stages with over-the-top set pieces and backgrounds. The textures manage to strike the right balance between simplicity and detail, creating an art style that pushes the system's prowess while still staying cartooning enough to hold up by today's standards. Speaking of art direction, this game clearly takes inspiration from the classics in terms of environments. Seaside Hill, Egg Fleet, and Frog Forest throw back to Green Hill, Wing Fortress, and Mushroom Hill respectively. The game draws on familiar classic cues without coming off as too redundant, which I think many Sonic fans can appreciate. Character designs are largely unchanged from the adventure games, and while the character models don't look quite as good as they did in Adventure 2 or Adventure DX, they still look nice during gameplay. Enemy designs, meanwhile, have changed quite a bit. The animal-shaped badniks of past games are gone, replaced by a new cast of robot baddies. While fans of the classics may miss their motobugs and caterkillers, I still find these new enemies sufficiently cartoony to fit into the Sonic universe. Besides, the new enemies make sense given the new combat system, but more on that later. Visually, Sonic Heroes is a solid title and the best looking game in the Dreamcast era. When it comes to music, Sonic Heroes is incredibly underrated. While it's not quite as good as Sonic Adventure 1, it comes pretty damn close in my opinion. Each act and boss fight in the game has its own musical track, and unlike Adventure 2, there's not as much emphasis on the electric guitar. That's not to say that Sonic Heroes doesn't have a share of rock and roll, personified in tracks like Egg Fleet, Rail Canyon, or Power Plant, but there's also a handful of techno tracks like Grand Metropolis and Casino Park, more atmospheric tracks like Lost Jungle and Hang Castle, or something more jazzy and funky like Mystic Mansion. The boss themes do a great job raising the tension and complement the battles quite well. Vocal tracks return as well, complete with a main theme, a final boss theme, and musical treatments for each team. The main theme, and what 
I made up are some of my personal favorite tracks from Crush 40, and this Machine and Team Chaotix are fantastic tracks as well. Team Sonic's theme, We Can, is probably the weakest, but overall the soundtrack is great stuff and a highlight of Sonic Heroes. With all of those observations on the table, it's time to discuss the gameplay, and boy is there a lot to talk about. One thing that's worth mentioning right off the bat is that despite Sonic Heroes technically having 12 playable characters, people who dislike the adventure games will be happy to know that there's only one gameplay style. As with the play styles in the adventure games, many older Sonic fans who grew up with the classic era have not received Heroes' gameplay very well, arguing that it's not loyal to what made the classic so darn great. While these people have certainly made justifiable criticisms of Sonic Heroes' gameplay, at the same time, I feel that many of these problems are either overstated or manufactured. As far as all the Sonic play styles are concerned, I consider Sonic Heroes' gameplay to be some of the best and most creative in the entire series. Regardless, it suffers from one major problem that I'll be getting to later. As stated in the previous reviews, I'd argue that the essential elements of a good Sonic gameplay style are thus. 1. The characters should be reasonably fast. 2. There should be an emphasis on platforming. 3. There should be familiar Sonic set pieces like rings, springs, and robot enemies. And 4. Completing an objective should be straightforward and simple. With these conditions in mind, how will the Sonic Heroes' gameplay meet them? Sonic Heroes sees you taking control of a team of three characters, who you swap between with the push of a button. Each character takes charge of their own formation, emphasizing their abilities. The exact moves of the formations vary slightly depending on the team, but they're almost entirely identical in terms of control and abilities. The speed formation forms a fast-moving Congo line that can homing attack into enemies and use a tornado move to stun enemies or swing on poles. The flying formation turns the trio into a slower moving totem that can fly short distances and shoot two of the members as electrified projectiles. The power formation forms a beefy V that can beat the shit out of enemies in no time flat, glide using fans, and launch teammates as fireballs. Knowing which formation to use and at what time forms the crux of Sonic Heroes' gameplay, and it's a really fun and creative playstyle. One of the criticisms that a lot of Sonic fans like to make is that the control is apparently too slippery. And honestly, I don't know what game these people have been playing. I'll agree that Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 had the better control, but I don't think the control has become so much more slippery since last time as to turn the game into an unplayable mess. Really, the control is only ever slippery when you're playing as the speed formation, which you'll generally be using only when you want to speed up on rails or run fast in a straight line. When it comes to exploring, you'll usually be playing as the power formation, which is decently fast but a little more weighty in terms of control. Slipperiness is never really a problem when it comes to platforming either, as any player with a sense of strategy will be using the slow and steady flying formation as insurance against bottomless pits. One can argue that making the speed formation so fast as to become slippery makes it not very useful, but it's still very much integrated into the level design and is very safe to use when traveling in a straight line or triangle jumping between walls. Knowing which formation to use and when is the entire point of the playstyle, and I'd argue that this applies just as much to tailoring your speed to the terrain as it does anything else. As for the level design, it's pretty darn good though not without its problems. If you've ever played a classic Sonic game, the stage structure should sound pretty familiar to you. There are 7 zones of 21 stages in Sonic Heroes. The first two acts are normal levels, while the final one often involves a boss fight with Dr. Eggman. Similar to Adventure 2, there are no hub worlds. Simply beat a stage and you'll go straight to the next one. Like the previous 3D games, the stages are generally pretty linear, but still a lot more open-ended than before. Most stages feature branching pathways, which are often split off by formation. Speaking of which, the level design does a great job making use of each team member. Nobody ever feels neglected, and the game isn't afraid to shake things up with new set pieces or stage hazards that force you to use your formations in new ways. This helps each of the level types feel distinct and memorable in their own right. Like Sonic 3 and Knuckles, the game tends to segregate speed and platforming into separate sections. There are parts where you get to go really fast and blaze through set pieces, and also parts where you have to slow down so you don't fall into a bottomless pit. I know that some people aren't a fan of this design philosophy, and believe that speed and platforming should be integrated 100% of the time. In my opinion, speed and platforming segregation is a perfectly legitimate way of reconciling Sonic's often contradictory gameplay elements. On top of the speed and platforming section, Sonic Heroes also places a lot of emphasis on combat, certainly more so than any Sonic game before besides maybe the arcade title Sonic the Fighters. People who didn't care for the Werehog in Sonic Unleashed, the bland combat in Sonic Boom, or the tedious box throwing and repeat homing attacking in Sonic 06 will be glad to know that the combat 
in Sonic Heroes is way better than in any of those games. Though enemies sport health meters, most of them go down in seconds from just a few hits. And because you have three different formations to play around with, there's a good but intuitive amount of strategy involved. While taking on enemies is a little more complicated than in other Sonic games, it doesn't drag things out nearly as badly as some people will have you believe, and makes use of attacks that feel well suited to characters in the Sonic universe. While characters are well suited to combat on their own, you can still level each of them up a total of three times using power cores. Leveling up characters deals damage faster, increases the splash damage of power characters, and turns Thunder Shoot into a game breaker. On top of this, collecting rings, defeating enemies, and using attacks will add to a special bar. When you fill it up, you can use a Team Blast attack that'll nuke every enemy on screen. Each team also gets a special bonus, such as free invincibility or temporarily stopping time. The combat in Sonic Heroes is well balanced, well paced, and most importantly, fun. The same thing goes for the boss battles, which are better than the ones in Adventure 1, but maybe not quite as good as the ones in Adventure 2. The face-offs with Dr. Eggman make great use of your characters and require a decent amount of effort, and also never come anywhere close to overstaying their welcome. The Mook Rush bosses are also pretty fun, giving you an excuse to go balls to the wall against a gauntlet of robot enemies while leveling up your characters and saving up for team blasts along the way. The only bosses that aren't any good are the team battles, where you face off with one of the other three teams. All you have to do is stand in the middle and spam the tornado. If it weren't for this strategy, these bosses would be the most annoying in the game, seeing as there's not really a clear way of fighting them. Overall though, the boss battles in this game are good, though there really should have been more of them for repeated playthroughs as different teams. So you might be wondering what makes the four teams different from each other in terms of gameplay. In general, the teams take the guise of different difficulties. Team Rose is the easy mode and has shorter stages, Team Sonic is the medium difficulty with medium length stages, and Team Dark is the hard mode and features slightly longer stages. For those teams, the goal is simply to get to the end of the stage without dying too many times. Team Chaotix is the oddball of the bunch in that their stages revolve around specific missions, which can range from defeating all the enemies in a stage, sneaking through a level without being seen, or collecting hidden chow. A lot of people really hate Team Chaotix, but I actually found it to be a welcome change of pace compared to the other teams. Compared to some of the shit you have to do in Shadow the Hedgehog or the Storybook games, these missions are pretty simple and entirely harmless. If you're the type who enjoys exploration factor in your Sonic level design, Team Chaotix gives you the most incentive to do so, particularly in the levels which task you with finding a certain amount of MacGuffins. The characters also do a good job of letting you know when a MacGuffin may be nearby, and there are usually a few extra collectibles that are actually required to beat a stage. Even the hardest mission, which tasks you with blowing out 60 torches, isn't as bad as it sounds if you're diligent. In general, the gameplay style in Sonic Heroes is rather solid on its own. The characters move reasonably fast, there's quite a bit of platforming, the familiar Sonic set pieces are all here and accounted for, and accomplishing objectives is simple and straightforward. The result is a creative, fun playstyle that might honestly be my favorite in the entire Dreamcast era. There's nothing quite like it in the rest of the series, and I totally understand why so many people want a Sonic Heroes 2. Unfortunately, Sonic Heroes as a package is undermined by a single flaw. In order to unlock the last story segment and finish the game, you have to beat all four teams and collect the seven Chaos Emeralds. Now. That wouldn't be so bad if Sonic Team had taken a few extra steps to shake things up for each team, but this is unfortunately not the case. The result is a lot of forced repetition that bogs down the pace of the game and makes replaying it a huge hassle. As I said before, there are a total of 21 stages in Sonic Heroes. Because you have to play each of them as all four teams, that means you have to clear a total of 84 stages to reach the end of the game. Now, Sonic Adventure 1 was also guilty of reusing its 11 stages, but that in itself was never tedious for several reasons. One, stages were reordered for different characters. Two, the multiple playstyles made stages feel different enough to be worth playing again. And three, you weren't forced to replay all 11 stages as all six characters. You only had to play stages that worked for that character, because, as the great Clement once said, it doesn't make sense for Big the Cat to fish in Speed Highway. Sonic Heroes, on the other hand, does not do nearly enough to distinguish one team from the other, besides Team Chaotix, of course. Why couldn't Sonic Team have reordered the stages for different teams, added exclusive enemies, added exclusive bosses, or done anything to separate one playthrough as one team from the others? Even this wouldn't be so bad if the stages were short, but these levels are some of the longest in the entire series. Later stages with Team Sonic 
Sonic start to push things at about 8 minutes a pop, and Team Dark stages almost always last about 10 minutes. Not unlike the supposed best Sonic game in years, Freedom Planet. Team Rose's stages, on the other hand, often feel a little too short and never realize their full potential. And again, if I only had to play as one team to beat the final boss, that wouldn't be so bad. But when you make me replay the same 8 minute long stages 4 times, I'm not gonna lie, this game just gets more and more tedious as it goes along. And the forced repetition doesn't just apply to replaying stages itself. The longer I played Sonic Heroes and the more teams I crossed off the list, the more I found myself annoyed at things I would have otherwise let slide. For example, why does jumping into a robot's lance or hammer count as taking a hit? If they're not attacking you with it, it shouldn't hurt you. Knockback from enemies can also send you into a bottomless pit. Team Dark also really overuses shields, which only serve to slow down the combat by a few extra tedious seconds. While I found the combat really fun and interesting with my first couple of teams, it started to become a chore by the third time around. While rail grinding is mostly safe if you know when to use the flying formation, there are many times where you're sent flying over a bombless pit in a scripted sequence and have to hope that the game will land you on top of a rail, and it doesn't always work. All of these things would be minor if you only had to play as one team, but when you're replaying the same stages over and over again, these flaws only compound the tedious repetition. Say what you will about Colors, Generations, and Lost World being too short, but they were still long enough to feel like complete experiences while not overstaying their welcome. Sonic Heroes is a good example of why longer isn't necessarily better when it comes to Sonic games. Not to mention that the highly revered Sega Genesis games weren't exactly super long themselves. And then we have the special stages. As you may know from watching my reviews of the classic series, I wasn't a fan of any of them besides Blue Sphere from Sonic. 3 Knuckles. Getting into stages was usually a pain in the ass, the stages themselves were easy to lose and didn't have a retry feature, and the stages themselves weren't fun or challenging in a rewarding way. Super Sonic was fun to play with in Sonic 2, but that never really outweighed the hell you had to go through to unlock him. I can't say I missed special stages in Sonic Adventure 1 and 2, and I can't say I'm happy to see them return here. One thing I can give Heroes credit for is that getting into a special stage isn't nearly as bad as it was in the first three classic games. All you have to do is collect the key from within a cage and take it to the end of the stage. You'll lose the key if you get hit, but there are multiple keys in each stage, and if you play as Team Rose, you can get into the special stage in just a few minutes. As for the special stages themselves, they're kind of like the ones from Sonic 2. Basically, you run down this tube chasing the emerald. Along the way, you have to collect links to fill a boost gauge, which you use to speed up and catch the emerald. If you can do that before the emerald reaches the end of the stage, you win. If you don't, you get kicked out of the stage and have to find another key just to try again. There are three mutually reinforcing problems here. One, the control is incredibly slippery. Two, the camera can sometimes leave something to be desired. And three, the boost can be rather finicky. As some of you may know, this marathon was originally going to be a collaboration between myself and another YouTuber named Hadox. Unfortunately, due to some serious personal matters, Hadox was unable to follow through with the collab and I ended up doing this marathon on my own. He has since recovered and rejoined YouTube. Point is, the Sonic Heroes review was originally going to premiere on his channel, and for that reason, he was supposed to record all the gameplay footage. Thus, when I wrote the original script for this video, I played the game without recording any footage. When the collab eventually fell through, I was left to replay and record the entirety of Sonic Heroes on my own. While I had a rather annoying time with the special stages in my original unrecorded run, in my second recorded run, I actually beat all seven of them on my first try. No joke. I figured out that you're supposed to hold down the boost button instead of mashing it, so that the characters will automatically go forward without having to hold up on the stick. Then, you can tap left and right to steer them around obstacles without things feeling anywhere near as slippery. Once I knew to do that, these stages became a lot easier, and for that reason, they can only offend me so much. Granted, the stages should have been more intuitive in control and design, and they're still not fun to play, but it's still possible to finish them without too much hassle if you know what to do. In sum, these special stages suck, but they could have been a hell of a lot worse. At the very least, I'm thankful that you don't have to collect all the emeralds as each team. If that were the case, I might have had to kill myself. Believe it or not, Sonic Heroes also has quite a bit of extra content. Returning from the previous two games are emblems, which you earn after completing a mission in a stage. Levels feature A missions, which you complete by beating the stage in the main campaign, and B missions, harder versions of each level that you access from the challenge mode. Completing all the missions in a stage will net you 28 emblems per team, with
with boss fights bagging 8 more, making for a grand total of 120 emblems. Every 20 emblems or so you'll unlock new modes in the multiplayer. Ranks return from Adventure 2, once again running from E to A, but because of the increased stage length they're a lot more annoying to go after than in Adventure 2. Still, getting the A ranks isn't too bad most of the time if you're careful to avoid bottomless pits and take the time to collect rings and level up your characters. Collecting all 120 emblems and getting all 141 A ranks will unlock a super hard mode. So just in case you didn't already find replaying the same stages 4 times tedious enough, you can do it a fifth time as Team Sonic, only harder. Needless to say, I have very little interest in 100%ing this game anytime soon. I personally got my fill from playing as Team Sonic and Team Chaotix, but there's surely a completionist out there somewhere who will get a out of unlocking everything. So that pretty much covers my thoughts on Sonic Heroes. Overall, I can see why some people consider it an underrated gem, while others see it as the start of the Dark Age. In some respects, it's the best game in the Dreamcast era. The cutscene to gameplay ratio is very balanced, the story presentation is the best of the three games, the art direction and presentation are excellent, and the soundtrack is phenomenal. The core team gameplay is creative, fun to play, and well integrated into the stages. The controls are better than people give them credit for, fighting enemies and bosses is a good time, and the the level design is pretty solid. As I said before, there's also a reasonable effort at making 3D Sonic look and play more like he did in the classic days, which some people might appreciate. When the teams are considered individually as their own games and on their own merits, they're all mostly fun to play beyond some minor annoyances. But when Sonic Heroes is considered as a package rather than the sum of its parts, it leaves some things to be desired. The forced repetition drags out the game to a tedious slog, meaning that combat loses its luster, otherwise minor gripes become more and more annoying as time goes on, and special stages, while not the worst in the series, pad out the game that much more. But is Sonic Heroes really the start of the Dark Age? In my opinion, no. This game may be repetitive when played all the way through, but it's a fun time when you just play the one or two teams you actually care about. And seeing as all four teams share the same levels and bosses, you can get a full experience out of Sonic Heroes by playing just one team. And even when you're playing all four teams in the last story segment, it's still nowhere near as tedious as finishing Shadow the Hedgehog. On top of that, the game is competently programmed and doesn't betray Sonic's tone and character by making things too dark, edgy, or serious. While Sonic Heroes teeters on the precipice and many respects, it's nowhere near as awful as Dark Age titles like Shadow, 06, Secret Rings, Chronicles, or even something like Sonic Boom. Unlike those games, Sonic Heroes actually has some redeeming factors. As for me, I think a romp through Team Sonic is some of the best gameplay that 3D Sonic has ever had, and possibly the best Sonic playstyle in the whole Dreamcast era. I can absolutely foresee myself revisiting Team Sonic or Team Chaotic somewhere down the line. Still, I have a limited desire to replay this game as all four teams ever again without a good reason. If I'm looking at all three Dreamcast era games as full packages, I still think Sonic Adventure 2 is my favorite. That's a game I could replay any day and still not get sick of it. Whereas Sonic Adventure 1 is kind of worn out its welcome with me, and Sonic Heroes runs out of steam after just two teams. There's a lot to like about Sonic Heroes, but it's nothing that would enter my personal top 10 favorite Sonic games. And that's pretty much all I have to say. Join me next time for the final video in this little marathon, Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2 Remake or Rebrake. I'll be comparing the Dreamcast versions of both games to the GameCube and 7th generation re-releases to see how they attempt to recreate and build upon the originals. Until next time, I'm X Paradigm Gamer, and I hope you all enjoyed the review. What's wrong?